Yes, sir. You can proceed, sir. Okay. So, good evening, all. And today we are going to discuss on to mid foot trauma. Essentially, navicular, cuboid, and one or two cases of cuneiform. Uh, so the session would be in the form of first, I am going to talk on to 10 commandments of midfoot trauma management. That's one of the very popular title I uh, deliberate at many places. And then I'm going to show you the video of navicular open reduction internal fixation. And once we do that, uh, then we'll go through the navicular and cuneiform and cuboid cases. So this is how uh, we would go ahead with. So let me start with my first talk on to 10 commandments of midfoot trauma management. By this talk, I just want to present in front of you principles of midfoot trauma management, which some or other how we have been discussing through the cases, but this would be uh, in a proper format. So, so the first and foremost principle is you should have high index of suspicion for midfoot trauma. So when you have a midfoot trauma, documented midfoot trauma, you must suspect injuries into the hind foot or forefoot and look for it. Now, look at this. Is there only a navicular fracture? This is how it was treated as a only navicular fracture. But there was also association of a cuboid fracture, cross cuboid fracture. So navicular and cuboid are like both forearm bones. They move together. So you must suspect injury of, with injury of one bone, you should suspect a radiologically undetectable injury of the other bone. Now look at this. This was a diabetic patient in whom this midfoot tibial trauma was treated as a sprain and then cellulitis and antibiotics were given. But this turned out to be a midfoot charcoal and it all broke. So you must suspect neuropathic fractures in diabetics. So that is the first principle that suspect midfoot injury. We have a good time devoted by the senior orthopedic surgeon to treat femur, tibia and the foot work is being done by the junior most person without really suspecting the injuries. Now, whenever you are dealing with a midfoot injury, you must use radiology to the most. Normally, we get internal oblique view which delineates fourth and fifth ray. But whenever you are dealing with navicular, whenever you are dealing with medial cuneiform or the first ray, you should be taking external oblique view. And sometimes you need traction views. Many times you need comparative views. And obviously, no question, CT scan is almost always needed. So that's the second principle that use radiology extensively. Sometimes you have to do preparation of both the limbs and you need to evaluate comparative intraoperative CM views. The case we posted just in the last, uh, I think today or a day before, I posted one case where there was missed navicular, I think, or uh, neglected navicular and uh, cuboid fracture. And then there was a calcaneo cuboid joint arthritis and talo navicular joint arthritis. For such a case, you need to prepare both the limbs and intraoperative, you need to compare the, both the limbs with the CM views because you either have a medial column shortening or a lateral column shortening and you must restore forefoot abduction or adduction to the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, preferred uh, kind of uh, comparative evaluation of, with the opposite side. So that is what is required. Then the very, very important focus whenever you are treating midfoot injuries is on your biomechanics. And what does biomechanics tells you? Biomechanics tells you that you have some essential joints in foot and ankle. Try to salvage them. 
fifth metatarso cuboid joint, fourth metatarso cuboid joint, they are essential joints. You try to salvage them. And talonavicular joint is the most essential joint after ankle joint in foot and ankle. So try to salvage such essential joints. But if you have non-essential joints, you may sacrifice it. Now the fourth principle or commandment of midfoot trauma management is perfect timing. Your timing should be perfect. Such an injury requires to be spanned, then scanned, wrinkles, planned, and performed. So such an injury, you would help have to go and follow span, span both the columns, not one column, then scan, then plan. And then look for the wrinkles. When the wrinkles are there, you perform the surgery. So this is how the perfect timing matters a lot into midfoot trauma management. The fifth principle or fifth commandment is typical fixation tactics. So for any midfoot injury, you first distract, then you reduce and fix, then you release the distraction. Do your radiological assessment whether it is remaining stable without distraction. And if it is so, you remove the expects. If it is not remaining stable, you continue the distraction for four to six weeks. So this is in general a principle of midfoot trauma to distract, fix, release distraction, do reassessment, and either continue or remove the expects. Now, so far as navicular fracture is concerned, if there is combination, then you put in a position screw. Don't compress it. May You may require bone grafting in between. If there is combination, you may put in a spanning plate, but no compression if there is combination. And then if you have a tuberosity fracture or you have a navicular fracture where there is a crack which is extending up to the tuberosity, fixation of tuberosity is a must. If you don't fix tuberosity accurately, the tibialis posterior which gets attached, which is the main stabilizer of the arch, would get lax and this patient may end up into secondary post-traumatic flat foot. In midfoot injuries, so far as fixation is concerned, you, if you cross the joint, if you span the joint, it is advisable and sometimes it is required for betterment of the stabilization. So for a navicular fracture, if you have a fracture into the lateral part of the navicular, you can put your screw from medial side going right up to the cuboid and vice versa. So cross the joints, sometimes you span the joint, it is advisable and preferred. And look at this navicular fracture where I have cross, I have spanned the joint. I have put in a joint sparing bridging plate where one screw is going from the second to third uh, uniform and one screw is put into the head and neck of the talus. This plate essentially would be removed at the end of six weeks. But this is giving, it is giving stability to my navicular fixes. Now, cuboid, reconstruction ladder of cuboid starts from inside and then you are going outside. So you start medially and come laterally. And this also comes back to one of the questions which I had put in, which I am going to answer in next one or two slides. In our group, I have asked one question and that was with regards to cuboid bone grafting. So that also I'm going to address. Whenever you are dealing with the cuboid reconstruction, you start a reconstruction from the intact joint side and then go to the compressed side. So suppose the metatarso cuboid joint is having much combination, you start with calcaneo cuboid reconstruction and vice versa. Always, 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 whenever you are leaving out a void into cuboid, which is very, very common, you feel with the cancellous bone graft, which you can take from proximal tibia, from calcaneus, but you must feel the void. And if you have an intact lateral wall, then you can push in cancellous grafts. But if the lateral wall, which is the lateral support, which is the main support of the lateral column of the foot, if that wall is broken, then you have to use cortico cancellous grafts. So this was the question I had asked earlier in our group. Now, this was a 24 years old male who had a closed injury, right? This was how the X-ray picture and the clinical picture was looking. He had over uh, commuted 
uh, shattered navicular with crushed cuboid with fifth metatarsal base with base of fourth metatarsal first second uh, second third fourth fifth uh, metatarsal also had i think calcaneus also so this were the ct images he was sent to us with the ct images otherwise uh, we would like to put in a distractor medial as well as lateral and we would have taken the uh, uh, CT scan thereafter. So looking to this kind of injury, a medial distractor, a lateral distractor, manual pressure aided reduction of the navicular dorsomedial medial fragment was done. And this is how the post distractor image AP and oblique looked like. And then in the second stage, we went in with a spanning medial plate, joint sparing, second metatarsal intramedullary fixation, and fixation of the fifth base was done with the screws. So, whenever you have a midfoot injury, mind you, you could use bilateral distraction because that will be helpful. If you distract only one column, the other column would get compressed. So, with a fracture, where you have a navicular combination and cuboid combination, you should be doing simultaneous distractor, distraction of medial as well as lateral column. As I have earlier spoken, I like to position the patient into a position where, which is what I called a flat foot position, so that my imaging, straight imaging is in the plane of the midfoot. And I put in a bump underneath so that my lateral image is not obstructed by the opposite thing. So this is how, this is the kind of image you would be able to see. And then a medial spanning plate was put, which was joint sparing plate. And second MT was fixed. There was a lateral distractor, which was continued for four to six weeks. And a CC screw was fixed for a fifth metatarsal base. This went on to unite and the distractor was removed. And this is how the picture looked. And this was the end result. So, and that's the moment of the space. Excuse me, sir. Please. Uh, sir, as I was looking that you have used Hinterman on both the sides. Hmm. So, when you are using Hinterman, you must be using some thick K wires for distracting. And they so, are 2.5 mm K wire. So, would you uh, use K wires only when you use them as a fixator or you need to use shan spins? No, no, I've been using uh, K wires and JS external fixator. It doesn't really matter. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. But you know, uh, Okay, when you see the navicular open induction video, you would learn that you should be smart enough to slide your clamps before you put in your Hinterman distractor. You know? So if you do not slide your clamps over your K wires, then you cannot really put in afterwards because then you have to remove the Hinterman distractor. How are you going to maintain the uh, distance? So that is the uh, trick I am going to show you. Uh, this was another navicular fracture, a uh, big fragment, and I showed you the X-ray earlier where I had put in a spanning plate and I have spanned this plate across the uh, two joints, which are later on was removed. And this is how the movements, uh, inversion, eversion, uh, dorsal flexion, plantar flexion was achieved. Now, this was the case of my friend, uh, Professor Chua. This was distracted and then the uh, reduction was done at uh, uh, metatarso cuboid joints with a lateral X-fix distraction, reconstruction. And because the lateral wall was destroyed, corticocancellous grafts were used and X-fix was kept for four weeks. And this was how the ultimate union looked like with a good function. The sixth commandment of midfoot trauma management is restoration of column length. Very, very important. You must restore the column length of medial as well as lateral. And as I also repeat what Dr. Rilon says, that these trauma always have some exit point. So, a medial side exit would go to the lateral side. So, there could be 
undetectable radiologically undetectable ligament or capsule ligamentous injury so you need by and large you need bilateral disector stage protocol for complex injuries suppose it's a very complex injury as i showed earlier a case to you bilateral distraction in stage one in stage two you scan and plan your fixation in stage three you look for the wrinkles and then go in for definite definitive fixation and try to avoid primary fusion whenever possible so this was a 37 year old male who had a polytrauma and had a midfoot injury which was diagnosed after five days and he had a huge swelling so this injury after five days was diagnosed so close reduction of dislocated medial cuneiform if you if you notice here the medial cuneiform was totally dislocated and this was so huge a swelling that there was no question of going in and this dislocated medial cuneiform was just relocated with percutaneous manipulation and closed k-wire fixation was done plus medial and lateral frame fixation was done this is how the lateral view looked like and this was uh, after uh, the removal of x -fix. and he is presently mobilized with firm medial r support and is awaiting for later that planned midfoot fusion Stage protocol is also followed for in open injuries. In an open injury, in stage one, you go in for debridement, bilateral distraction, closed manipulation of displaced fragment, plus or minus temporary fixation with k wires. In stage two, you go for scanning and planning, and in stage three, you go for definitive fixation together with plastic reconstruction and try to avoid primary fusion. This is the message i already gave earlier that in midfoot injuries uh, you have to go in for preservation of the joint as far as possible and don't go for primary fusion uh, there's a question how much to distract how to reset so that's where i said that if you have a very bad injury then you just paint and wrap both the sides so that you can always compare otherwise it would be important to little over distract so that you are able to manipulate the fragment. You will be able to see under the CM that how much you have distracted. Distracted, you can have the previous image and you can compare it with this image after distraction. Joints gets opened up and you know that yes, you have distracted enough. Reduce it, fix it, release the distraction. So you're not going to keep it over distracted. Okay, then. open injury now this was a compound injury in a male of 37 run over injury this was the kind of wound picture on day one then the x-ray showed compound subtalar dislocation compound talonavicular dislocation midfoot injuries multiple metatarsal fractures and this into the index center was treated with ct scan before reduction, which should not have been done, you must do reduction first and then send your patient to CT scan. And on day one, this is how he was treated, a transcalcaneal calcaneotalar ankle pin was passed and then this two wires were put in and whatever primary suturing could have been done, that is what was done. And then this was referred to us after fifth day. So on day five, he came in with this picture. Wounds were looking angry. The skin had already gone black. The skin was also not looking good. So on day five, we went in for revision debridement. And at the same time, it was a flap coverage which we wanted to give. And whatever best fixation we could do primarily with k wires was done and sural neurocutaneous flap is a flap which works well for such midfoot injuries so this flap was rotated and the defect was covered and this is how we put in multiple k wires the first thing we did was to remove that pin 
and because I never wanted to uh, cross the ankle. So two K wires were passed just to stabilize the subtalar dislocation when it was just the six days post -trauma. And then some lost K wires and uh, this is how it was stabilized and it was so stable that there was no need to put in uh, long term expix. This went on to heal and this was the final uh, clinical picture. Patient went back to his hometown with his own orthopedic surgeon and this was the x-ray he signed to me uh, before a year and a half or two years. Then I onwards I've never seen him, but I'm I'm informed that he's mobilized with a medial R support as advised by me. Uh, surgeon is continued with the medial R support and is waiting for later date plan mid foot fusion. Uh, there's a question: How do you bury or cut lost K wire, or do you do flap by yourself or done by plastic surgeon? So okay. So uh, Harjot. Uh, uh, the K wire should be, you know, first passed crossing the opposite cortex and then you take a temporary measure, withdraw it and cut it flush and then punch it. So this is the way I uh, cut and I keep the wire as a lost K wire. Provided I feel that this particular area will not require any further stabilization uh, and this k wire is not going to come in the way, I do the same. Uh, so at the time of you, so that also answers your, uh, that answers your question. Uh, uh, that yes, lost k wires uh, are placed, are to be placed in such a manner that they do not come into the, in the way of fusion. Yes, in the case which I showed, some of the lost key wires are going to come in the way of fusion, but there are ways and means to tackle it. Uh, do you do flap by yourself or done by plastic surgeon? So I have stopped doing flaps on my own. My dissertation was orthoplastic procedures. So I used to do a lot of fasciocutaneous, myocutaneous and muscle flap on my myself. And I was also going to my juniors who never used to afford plastic surgery to do this clubs free but since the advent of this consumer protection act i have stopped doing flaps on my own and that is what would be my advice to you also because if the expertise is available don't do it i mean we do it for the patient's comfort that they may not be able to afford plastic surgeons but that should not be done uh, looking to the uh, scenario of consumer protection act the ninth commandment is fusions for delayed presentations. So when you have a real delayed presentation, which is beyond two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, I think you need to go in for fusion. While you are doing fusion, you must reduce the joints. You must restore the column length and you must prepare the joint and do the bone grafting. So not that you should be doing fusion in situ. You should be correcting the medial as well as lateral column length and then fusing it. And so now can anybody uh, come up with the diagnosis in this case? This was a patient who came to us, was treated in a plaster and he presented to us at the end of uh, six or seven months, I guess. Uh, yeah. The navicular and the cuneiforms are dislocated and there is a cuboid comminution. Okay, so is that the cuboid? process of calcaneum is fractured. And the process of cuboid is also fractured. Yes, 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 yes. So, so, this is how he was treated in the plaster. So, now what? Late presentation of midfoot trauma. It is can be a similar mm -hmm. case. By column fusion. Yes. And destruction. So, but here you will need to do fusion of navicular cuneiform joints. Right. Yes, the navicular joint is absolutely all right. You should not be fusing it. But there is a shortening at the lateral column and lengthening of the medial column. Forefoot is abducted. Correct? This is a weight bearing exit. Ganesh? 
What about cuboids? Yeah, so there is a forefoot which has gone into abduction with a shortening of the lateral column and lengthening of the medial column. So yes, herein, what you would need to do, you would need to put this incision as well as this end. Then you will need to do simultaneous correction, mind you. You cannot do yes, one sir. correction, yeah. And this you're going to need distraction calcaneo cuboid fusion. Then only the whole medial column, which has gone abducted, would come round into the neutral position. So this is a scenario where you need draping of both the limbs and you need to compare it with the opposite side. So this is how this was treated with the plaster and this Sir. presented to us at the end of eight months like this. Uh, any particular view, uh, extra view for this kind of fractures? No, your normal AP oblique view should be good enough. Uh, if it is only a medial column, you can go for external oblique. But otherwise, normal AP oblique view should be good enough. No, sorry. So this was the trauma X-ray, which was treated as in, into the plaster as a contusion. And then this is how this man presented to us at the end of eight months. And then can you see this gap here in an oblique view? So this navicular cuneiform joints are dislocated. There is shortening of the lateral column, lengthening of the medial column. So at eight months, we went in, we got the CT scan, and we did navicular cuneiform fusion plus distraction calcaneo cuboid fusion. You can see this wage graft put in into the calcaneo cuboid space. And so when you're doing such a surgery, you put in a hinterman distractor here, one limb into the cuboid, one limb into the calcaneus, and go on distracting it. And compare with the opposite side, whether you are not over distracted. So that is one method. Second method, and this comparison is with the mimicking of weight bearing. So you put the foot. Can you see my hand? I just wanted to show you, but I did not got the opportunity to take a small video today. So I'm just showing you that how do you do? Can you see this calendar? Yes, sir. Not. Yes. Is that okay? No, sir. Yes. Not. Uh, it's a blur one. The image is getting superimposed with the background, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'll just take up some journal. So this is the flat lead of our, you know, implant boxes. They have a lead. Yes. So can you see this lead? It's getting blurred, sir. Okay. Now, can you see this bone model? Put in over the lead? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you put in a lead of an implant box underneath the foot, and then you press this foot from the top and take your image. Take the image similarly of the opposite side and compare whether your column length is restored or not. Or what you can do, you can take an image without distraction and then you can take an image with distraction and notice whether the coverage of medial column or coverage of the navicular over talus or coverage of cuneiform over navicular is established or not. This is the way you see intraoperatively. Somebody was asking me that how do you make sure intraoperatively that you have uh, Sir, so you, uh, don't, you don't fix it with any plate or anything, sir. This CC uh, calcaneo Metal side? Yes, sir. So that's a mistake. I should have fixed it with uh, uh, a plate on a lateral side. Or if you're not fixing it with the plate, put in two temporary K wires. I guess this is the final image. So I might have put in two temporary K wires, which I might have removed at the end of four weeks. 
But do you osteotomize before you put in the Hinterman's distractor? No, this you just have to separate this. You just oh, have to separate away. this. You just have to do the soft tissue distraction, and you just have to curate this uh, area out, and then you distract. Okay. Sir, uh, is there any? Can we take the iliacus graft, the tricortical iliacus graft, and model it on the table? This is a tricortical iliacus graft only. So, I keep the iliacus prepared, graft, and then I learn about the amount of wage graft. Normally, it is eight mm, six to ten mm would something. Uh, like this would be the wage and then once i measure this then i take it with the uh, micro sagittal saw i take the graft and then i punch that graft in sir is there any protocol to fix uh, any column first medium or middle or lateral column first no, is there ideally ideally the column where you have to put in your graft should be fixed first because that is the column you want to lengthen that okay. is the column which you want to lengthen. So if it is on a uh, lateral side, which is the case most often than not, uh, you lengthen it first and then go on to the medial side. Right. Yes, yes, sir. Sir, in such a case, we we'll like to put an incision on both the sides. We we'll like oh, to check for I the say. lengthening. That's what I said earlier. Yes, sir. There has to be a simultaneous incision, simultaneous correction. Otherwise, you are not going to get this thing. Thank you, sir. And these are challenging. So, these are challenging ones. So once, so one method, as I said, is to temporarily distract and check with a mimicked weight bearing on table whether you gain the correct coverage or not. So that is one method. The second method is that whenever you are distracting the lateral column. You must have sufficient eversion left after your distraction. If your distraction is over distraction, then you are going to lose eversion and patient would have a high arch because you are making a making of uh, uh, making that particular foot to go into a cavus foot. So you check the residual eversion into your affected limbs. So, uh, subtalar joint, passive eversion. So that also is another method to make sure that you have adequately distracted, you not under distracted or over distracted. And this is a very, very important point. This is what I wanted to stress uh, while we were discussing today. So is that clear? Sir, is that clear? Uh, so, so was it a pure lateral subluxation of the forefoot or was it dorsal lateral subluxation? I, I don't remember for this particular case, but this also is a dorsal plantar subluxation together with a, a mediolateral rotation. So, uh, the reason why I was asking is because, uh, you know, if there's some dorsal subluxation, then the medial arch would be slightly collapsed and we may have to reconstruct the medial arch with a plate or something, buttress it from below. Was that no, required, sir? No, no, not from below. But the sir. medial arch reconstruction always happens when you la lengthen the lateral column. So sir. that's the same principle we follow when we do arch reconstruction. Lateral column lengthening, it would always, always reconstruct the medial arch. And how okay, do you know that when you put this graft, you put this graft onto the dorsal aspect of the calcinocuboid joint, right, not sir. onto the plantar aspect or not into the center. So it rotates around the acetabulum pedis, the whole foot. Exactly. And, and when you're putting a dorsal graft, it automatically depresses, it automatically maintains the arch. Thank you, sir. So the graft is played, placed in a dorsal aspect. This is not a flat foot reconstruction. So here, if the arch is not collapsed, and probably it was not, if I see the, now you can see this. You can see this. The arch is not collapsed. Okay, arch sir. Is maintained. So herein, I will put graft somewhere. So suppose this is 
calcaneus. This is cuboid. If the arch is well maintained, I will put in graft here. If it is hyper arch, I will put in graft here. And if it is a collapsed arch, I will put in graft here. So put in graft here would give me the arch. Put in graft here would give me the reduction of the arch. Clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Because because your your iliacris graft, whatever you are taking, is tricortical graft. And you have a cancel a surface here. You have a cancel a surface here. So this part of iliac crest has a fixed break. So your graft would be like here. Your graft cannot span completely across the calcaneus and cuboid. It is always going to be, uh, you know, keeping some part of the calcaneus cuboid joint empty. That is the advantage that you can adjust your arch height. I hope I made things clear. Yes, sir. Sir, there is a residual uh, space still visible uh, on the lateral aspect of the navicular. So, was it a difficult uh, uh, case to reduce? First thing, and at any point, did you th thought of putting a plate uh, because of the deformation forces that might be there so that you don't have impact idea? You can put in a plate for naviculocuboid, uh, uh, naviculocuniform uh, fusion. And those days, this typical H shaped plate, which comes specifically uh, for a naviculocuboid fixation, was not available with me otherwise this is the kind of plate which comes for NC joint something like this Hmm? Okay, sir. That was not available probably those days. So I just fixed with two screws and I just came out. Yeah, but if that kind of a plate is there, it is always better. So this requires a lot of undermining of skin, that plate, sir? I don't think so. You do. But it requires, definitely it requires complete release of naviculo cuneiform joints to bring those cuneiforms back into action. Okay. And now, if you see here, I have put in graft halfway, right? So, because I never required much of the arch restoration. And if you see, this patient already had cavus, little cavus. So, I never wanted to work more on to gaining more height. So this is where it was put. You can put it here also. You can put it here also. So any particular plate would have been used if you would have been fixed with the plate. So plate for calcunicuboid joint is the one which you use for cervical spine anterior uh, ACDF. So it's an H shaped plate. Now so many such plates are available. It is like a, a rectangle plate or edge shape plate or plate for cervical spine fusion. Now, this is the plate which you can, you can even use a straight plate for cuboid for two or three holes, uh, calcaneocuboid joint. But you see the trajectory of passage of screws in calcaneocuboid joint is very, very difficult. And for that, see, uh, I hope you're able to see this bone model. Are you able to see this bone model? Uh, no, sir. It is more. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now I can. See. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, because these two bones are flat, you really do not have a great trajectory to pass your screws. So, if you want to pass a screw from calcaneus to cuboid, you should be going with your skin entry, which is quite 
distal. So from this part of cuboid, you go from distal to proximal. Hmm? Rather proximal to distal, sorry. So from oh. proximal to distal, this should be the trajectory. You should be going underneath the skin, which is yes. quite away from your intended place from where you want to pass the screw. Yes. And the another play for you to pass the screw is this place. Are you able to see my, my, my pen, my black pen? Yes, sir. And model. So anterior process, there is a place where anterior process starts. And this place is the base of the anterior process. From there, you have a trajectory and a perfect angulation to pass a screw which passes from calcaneus to cuboid. So by and large passage of calcaneus cuboid joint requires a lot of, uh, you know, patience and expertise. So people prefer using a plate for calcaneus cuboid joint fixes. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Mm, you should be smart into post-operative accents. Sometimes you have to do secondary skin closer. You may have to timely remove the implant. Such an implant should be removed at the end of six months because you don't want to make your joint so stiff, more so talonavicular joint. Long lasting venous edema is a rule. Inform your patient that patient is going to have edema for nine months. And your specialized physiotherapy is in form of therapy and balance board and proprioception. And for all midfoot injuries, you must give postoperative support for six to nine months. <laughs> so that was about. I handle it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not Keep the microphone closed. So this was about basic principles to manage uh, midfoot injuries. And then uh, we'll go on to uh, video of uh, navicular fixation. So this video has a sound and if you're not able to listen to the sound, just tell me. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, just tell me. I'm starting the video. And this, this video demonstrates open reduction and internal fixation of fractured navicular in a 30 years old female who sustained road traffic accident. X-rays so terminated segmental displaced intra-articular fracture of left navicular. CT scan examination is a must for a midfoot injury to really learn the deformities and displacement of fractures. Midfoot injuries involve both the columns and in this case, injury force got exited laterally, giving rise to a large displaced fracture of anterior process of calcaneus. I positioned foot flat on a table to keep foot in a plantigrade position. I use a bump under ipsilateral gluteal region and a bump under midfoot to support the foot. This position helps to do imaging into the correct plane of midfoot. Incision is marked with the help of K wire as a template. Vessels are also marked. Incisions are marked medially as well as laterally. Wrinkle sign is an important sign for us to go in and decide for the safe surgical intervention. This patient was operated after one week post trauma. Management ladder of midfoot injuries is distraction followed by fixation. Two 2.5 mm K wire are passed for this purpose. 
proximal k wire is passed into taller neck and distal k wire is passed into first metatarsal base or medial cuneiform using hinterman distractor as a guide a straight incision is marked extending proximally from tail joint distally till up to navicular cuneiform joint incision is placed with gentle pressure so as not to damage cutaneous nerves deeper dissection exposes tendon of tibialis anterior which needs to be retracted and preserved once you retract this tendon the whole fracture is exposed from lateral to the medial aspect identification of the talo navicular and navicular cuneiform joints is done with k wire distraction is done with the help of hinterman distractor and jes external fixator where two clamps are slid over k wire followed by passing of a rod through the clamps once the tightening is done hinterman distractor is slid and distraction is carried this is the image before distraction and once you start distraction with the hinterman distractor the ligamento taxis gives a fantastic reduction as well as precise lengthening of the medial column reduction is typically built from lateral to medial the lateral displaced fragment is punched in into reduced position and is temporarily fixed with a k wire passing from lateral fragment going right up to the tibials and metatarsals joystick reduction of the tuberosity fragment is the next step done this is done with the help of a k wire once the fragment is reduced and is checked under image temporary fixation of this medial fragment is done with a k wire which passes distally through the tarsus and metatarsals image check of this temporarily stabilized fracture is done in lateral as well as ap plane fragment specific mini plate is used which can be tailored to the size and shape of the bone with the use of locking towers as templates screw fixation through the plate is done leaving behind holes where the comminution comes into way final image after plate fixation with distraction on looks like this on radiology clinical picture after fixation of the mid looks like this lateral exposure is done with a distal sinus tarsi approach extensor digitorum brevis is exposed this is cuboid and that's the anterior process of calcaneus that's the fracture and a temporarily stabilized k wire into the anterior is seen here image check after temporary fixation shows the perfect alignment of anterior process of calcaneus which is then fixed with a compression screw and neutralization is done with mini fragment plate final siam image looks like this a distractor is on a navicular plate a lateral plate excellent reconstruction of the joints is seen in the lateral ap and oblique views closer is done into layers and this is how the post operative clinical picture looks so that was about uh, another 
this video missed one step where the middle segment which was communicated was pushed in with uh, proximal tibia bone grafting i think i showed a older version anyway now we are going to run through some cases and uh, maybe this will try to make it interactive so now this was a 48 years old male and he had a twisting injury diagnosis and management anybody can volunteer avulsion fracture of the navicular bone needs fixation sir So, how would you treat this? So, this needs a surgical fixation of the uh, fragment with a screw, if possible. Otherwise, uh, it's a plate uh, acting as a buttress plate. Okay. And uh, would you think that this you would be able to fix with a screw? So, very so that small is why fragment. I told a uh, fragment specific uh, plate, which will uh, position the plate in such a way that that will act like a buttress over the fragment. Suppose you are not able to fix this fragment, then by trying to fix it, you... Uh, yes. I think this must be fixed and this has to be because uh, better excision, rather than excision, we have to try to fix it. Yeah, so even if you do excision, uh, then you make sure that the capsular part, you try to reconstruct it with a suture anchor. So either... Uh, uh, fixation with a small mini fragment screw and you may put in a buttress plate or you could just excise it and put in a suture anchor. By and large, Any particular like, plate that has to be used? See, you can always use a plate which is spanning talonavicular joint but that has a disadvantage that you need to keep it for some few uh, months and then you have to again remove it. So, uh, if you can use a simple plate uh, which is spanning over the navicular, not going over the talus or cuneiform, that would be ideal one. If at all you want to span it, then you span the talon, uh, instead of talon navicular joint, you span navicular cuneiform joint and press it like a buttress. So, this is the, ever as you people rightly said, this is an evolution fracture of navicular. 47% of navicular fractures are these fractures. And it's an inversion and plantar flexion injury of tallow navicular ligament. Sometimes you must, uh, I mean, you must rule out the associated mid tarsal injury because that is very common. If it is non-displaced, you can treat into the plaster for four to six weeks. Displaced, you could uh, do uh, excision if it's a small fragment. But if it is one fourth, but if five percent of the articular surface, you need fixation with either key wire or screw. Now, best navicular revulsion. So, I think I this, this is this is this a video? It's not working. So, best. Navicular revulsion would require simple excision. Okay. Now, this is a case where a 53 years old male who had a road traffic accident was treated by bone setter and this was the x-ray at four weeks. Diagnosis? So, can I have fourth metatarsal? Yes, agreed. Anything else? So there is a fracture along the navicular oh, tuberosity. Right. I need an, a proper AP X-ray. Proper view, yeah. That's, like view. That's what I wanted you people to come out with. So you must have another view. If you see the central view, you will feel you will pass this as a normal X-ray. But when you see the other oblique views, then you see really that there is a navicular tuberosity fracture. And this is now at the four weeks. So what would you do? Would you leave it alone? Would you fix? Why? Open it. Why? No, fixing. It's a larger fragment. Dr. Vishal, Dr. Ganesh, yes. let, 
let Dr. Vishal answer. Dr. Vishal, why would you fix it? Positively, positively, positively. Exactly. Exactly. And would you only fix or would you, and how would you fix like? I don't screw or take That's all or anything else you would do? Bone graft? Bone graft, absolutely. Because you don't Four want weeks. to shorten it. Yes. Because you don't want to shorten the navicular articular surface. This is, I mean, out of the total coverage of Taylor head by navicular, this fragment is giving 30% coverage. So you need to restore the integrity of cover. Otherwise, if you compress it, then patient would have more exposed talus. Then patient can also secondly develop flat foot. So you must put in bone graft. And you must restore the complete integrity of navicular articular surface with talus. So this was the X-ray. Uh, this were the CT images, and this were the other CT images. And management obviously was a straight dorso medial incision. This is how the fibrosity fragment was exposed, and filled in with the bone grafts and fixed with one screw and went on to heal. At that time I've used, position I have used, uh, uh, I've used a washer. I not, it should not have been used because it would definitely impinge onto TBLS posterior tendon. And this, uh, I mean, if you have packed good amount of grafts you can put in as a compression screw uh, but by and large position screw should be put in because there is combination how many weeks do you immobilize after this procedure sir yeah it should be that's a good question it should be immobilizing a little bit of inversion and slight plantar flexion for four weeks <laughs> so because one screw it is not going to give you a good hold or uh... i agree Rotational stability also. I agree. I so, agree. Even if you have a good hold, then also you should try to neutralize the pull of TBLS posterior by, in, you know, uh, immobilizing this patient into inversion and plantar flexion. Okay. So there are four basic varieties of navicular fracture, cortical levels in fracture, tuberosity fracture, these two we described, body fractures and a stress fracture. The body fractures, we show a lot many cases. And this was the case the video we saw. So I will rush through this case. Okay. Now this was a fixation of navicular with screws and uh, neutralization by a spanning plate. I think we did show this picture before. We did show this. Okay. This case we did discuss earlier in our presentation. So I will skip it. So all navicular tuberosity fracture should be fixed if there is yes. a little displacement yes. also. No question. No question. Because tibial is supposed to be such a strong muscle after tendo Achilles, it is the strongest muscle. So it will always uh, evolve this fragment more. So non so in, inevitable. So in fresh fracture also, we have to use partially threaded or positional only screw. If there is no combination, you should be putting it as a uh, uh, compression screw. If it is a lot of combination and gap at the articular area, then you may be watchful in giving compression. Okay. So such a yeah, also. Female, female 27 with road traffic accident diagnosis. Navicular gel fracture dislocation with fracture of the uh, middle and uh, lateral cuneiform, along with uh, capsular revision of the um, uh, from distal anterior surface of the ankle uh, tibia. Anything on the lateral side? Uh, cuboid also is fractured. Cuboid also fractured. 
and anything on the minor base of, tarsal neck side base of the fifth and fourth fifth of the second fourth and fifth. third and fourth and neck, neck of, of neck of fourth neck of second third fourth okay yeah yeah so it's second third so this is how the ct scan showed the combination again this was the 3d ct the skin condition was very bad so obviously in stage 1 uh, which diameter screw to be used for navicular tuberosity is the question someone has asked i think it depends on the size of the tuberosity but you can get out by using sometimes even 4 mm cannulated cancellous screw or 3 mm 3.5 mm is also a good screw so stage 1 distraction was done stage next uh, this was the lateral image this bone should have been punched to slightly up this is not the good scenario that is a navicular yeah that's a navicular piece okay and then uh, uh, we went in and we did the uh, distraction and a plate spanning talo navicular joint and to navicular cuneiform joint and this is how that piece is also now buttressed with the plate went on to unite after how many days sir of distractor i think it was normally wrinkles take about 10 days 10 days and then you can go in and fixator was removed this is and when do you remove the fixator sir yeah that is a question somebody asked four to six weeks okay uh then a 39 year old male had a closed injury treated with plaster now 24 months okay hmm. 24 months i don't know whether i have ct scan or not okay so when you have such a mm. cuboid navicular cuboid yeah and there also is some impaction of the okay okay talus talus yeah so for such cases i think i guess fusion would only be the answer and look at this this was another case where there was a collapse of navicular almost like a avn of the navicular and mm -hmm. talo navicular arthritis in such a case you will have to excise it completely put in one or two bone grafts lengthen it and put in one or two plates So talonavicular fusion with two bridge plates and bone grafting, and these bone grafts are solid bone grafts from iliac crest. The screw AVN heads appear to. Be... Mm -hmm. uh, those does those screw heads cause any kind of irritation because? They... Yeah, these plates you need to remove at the yeah. end of uh, nine months. Okay, sir. Okay, do you is, ever face CRPS as a complication in such injuries or any kind of injuries which would? Uh... Yeah, in midfoot injury, uh, probably a case would come where it was a midfoot injury, very bad injury. There were three flaps done. In that patient, I had no opportunity to really go in and do fixation. In fact, patient had a uh, complex regional pain syndrome. and landed up with lot of stiffness and and just a dorsiflex and plantar flex uh no inversion inversion ultimately has done well but it took very very long time so this was 10 months old missed navicular and cuboid injury so now what so there is a shortening on the lateral side cuboid? yeah yeah so okay distraction with the bone graft cortico kidney on a medial side or lateral side lateral side lateral side. so so can you see this somebody was asking about the plate plate yeah. this is a simple plate i have used on a cuboid side so simple plate and my one screw is passing from uh, distal to proximal from cuboid to calcaneus so this is a very difficult trajectory mm -hmm. so talo navicular fusion plus calcaneo cuboid fusion using bone grafting 
they are all the scrancelous crew sir do you first pass a guide wire and then drill and do or yes guide wire is passed first and then you push in cancellous screws okay in this case already we discussed about now this is important you know, so someone was asking about the tuberosity fracture so this was 21 years old male who had trauma which was treated as sprain and was and then he had a persistent pain diagnosis spot diagnosis anybody dr rajiv call tuberosity tuberosity evolution so can i can we get a view of the opposite foot as well sir for <laughs> comparison yeah so you got the looks like there. an accessory navicular sir so it Incidental is an accessory finding. navicular avulsion fracture hmm? sir yeah so you must have a opposite side view and clinically there would be spot tenderness and if you get a routine view and if they are able to wait by wait by any view then you are able to differentiate so this was a fracture of the accessory navicular and treatment would be a short incision and excision of the navicular and reattachment of tibialis posterior with a suture anchor or a pull out suture into navicular if there is associated flat foot this should be an opportunity for you to do flat foot procedures surgical procedures as well so this is how you excise the uh, navicular reattach the uh, tibialis posterior tendon and this patient also had um, valgus heel for that i did medial calcaneal slide of short away now this was a fall in a female of 37 years closed injury diagnosis cuneiform fracture cuneiform fracture video uh, i think i think you people know a great deal of foot and ankle so this was treated with baloney plaster okay it was it okay no no okay sir. so you want to fix who said sir. no sir me sir dr hari so, hari hari sir you feel that uh, this should be treated with uh, surgery so it's a fracture which sir. is not extending into the tarsal metatarsal joint if it is extending into navicular cuneiform joint then also you can treat conservatively with a plaster but if it is extending with a combination with a shortening of the medial column into tarsal metatarsal joint then it definitely requires uh, distraction yeah so but look at this this was a road traffic incident in a male 33 years closed injury managed by uh, dr hari sir sir it it is it has to be distracted and fixed sir yes definitely yes. because yeah okay so open fund it distracted it and put in plate plate yeah. and this plate would be removed at the end of 4 to 6 months now this is the case i was talking about male who had a road traffic incident bad so this is the case which somewhere they asked me you present your worst trauma case and that time i think it was for 2 3 years i presented this case that it was a bad soft tissue injury right foot this was a day 4 presentation and just go on seeing the pictures and this were the x rays so he had a calcaneus mm. comminuted cuneiform medial i mean a metatarsal bad injury so compound comminuted fracture medial cuneiform involving navicular cuneiform joint second metatarsal base comminuted calcaneus and this is how the four so so the debridement of wound was not done on day 1 and present patient presented on day 4 so in stage 1 we went in did the debridement mis fixation of calcaneus was tried medial distractor lateral distractor and close intermedial kvr fixation of second metatarsal so this is how the picture looked like on after our medial as well as lateral distractor we thought we have done very good job and we were happy very good and no it was not good <laughs> see so this was 
three four days down the line this getting skin yeah getting blacked and so abductor hollis's flap was done he said okay the story is over but then story was not over because he also had a problem here so a sural neurocutaneous flap was done abductor hollis's flap was done there was another flap which was done and we hardly had a chance to fix the medial cuneiform and mm. this is how this patient went in into even rsd can you see this pictures typical yeah. of rsd mm. Mm. so then someone uh, you know got me in correct plane and asked me that whether you had a rsd in any of your case so this is that case and this is the end result just a dorsiflexion and a plantar flex does they have pain sir when they walk in these conditions not really because they they lose complete inversion inversion yeah it is only when they walk on uneven surface yeah. they have they have pain. otherwise they can do routine work. i i i think this patient is now lost i told him that you're going to require fusion <laughs> if you see him pain but he has not reported back it's now about 6 or 7 years that i treated him can you see there is one flap here also yeah posterior now ha huh, this was yeah, 6 years old male type 1 diabetes this is trauma x ray management anybody navicular fracture with uh, cuboid and also base of fifth metatarsal um, even even lateral cuneiform also yeah mm -hmm. so yes. how would you manage this patient first get a ct scan or put a distractor both on medial and lateral side and then get a ct scan if somebody wants me to talk on to crps i think that's a big chapter yeah, pain management specialist would be better to talk on to that uh, okay male 20 okay so you want to do that okay so you want to get a Uh, CT scan and a distractor, but this is how somebody hmm. did the fixation. Hmm. The moral of the story: Why I wanted this case to be discussed was Start that we did, yeah, we did spoke. Type one diabetes. Yeah, so this patient had a trivial trauma, hmm. and he had this. And, and can you see this? Yeah, flakes of bone that you. Okay. Can you see these dilated vessels here? Twenty-six mm. years. This, yes, but twenty. But it is a type one diabetes. Yes. Type Probably one. So we might be having diabetes. some long time. Yeah, long time. So he this is suggestive of Charcot. Something going wrong. Charcot. So that was not a good idea. And can you see this? Mm. So this is something which should give you suspicion that type one diabetes mellitus. trauma and came to you with this accident so surgeon went in and fixed so many things k wires and all this thing and it was after 5 months that this patient came to us walking with a painless deformed foot rocker bottom kind of a foot and this where the plano valgus kind of a midfoot deformity was treated with a plantar plate and the corrective midfoot fusion and this is how the charcot foot was reconstructed and the arch was reconstructed the message i want to give is that in a diabetic patient the neuropathy can always cheat you and you should be watchful you should be uh, having high index of suspicion uh with regards to neuropathy does the skin in a neuropathic or charcot joint behave in a similar way or do you uh, put additional care in it while operating so it's a topic in uh in itself for discussion but you need 
longer stronger combination fixation and whenever your fixation is spanning across talo navicular joint you also need to lock your fixation with a subtalar joint fusion and you should fix medial as well as lateral polar that is what in nutshell i can say Okay. So the uh, the Sharko patients, sir, they usually present with this fused uh, midfoot mass. So do you do some osteotomy of the midfoot to reposition before you do a plantar fixation, plate fixation? So, yeah. So that's a very good question. So these patients usually have a plano valgus bone, and you have to do osteotomy, which is in two plane. In one plane, you are going to do medial close wedge osteotomy. In a plane, sagittal plane, you're going to do plantar-based osteotomy. So in a sagittal plane, your osteotomy is with the plantar base. So you are closing it and you are recreating the arch. In a coronal plane, your osteotomy is medial closing osteotomy. So the valgus is closed. Okay, sir. 70% of the deformity, 75% of the deformity are with the medial uh, plan, plano valgus deformity. Okay, sir. thank you. Sir. So for a cuboid fracture, you need restoration of length of your lateral column to make sure that your TMT joints are stable. You have TMT as well as CC joints congruent. And before putting XPIX for a cuboid fracture, you should draw your anterolateral approach. You draw your fourth and fifth empty, you draw your calcaneus and then put in your uh, XPIX. Sometimes you can put in a medial to lateral uh, calcaneal pin and then you can, uh, over that pin, you can put in your medial and lateral distant. So uh, this is the way you, this is a trick that you put in one wire and then put in a sleeve and put in other wire. So this is how you could have two wires into the distal end of metata distal end of fixator into the metatarsal base and when you are doing definitive fixation for cuboid fracture you must restore the length you do the articular reduction you grab the defect and you maintain the length these are your principles sometimes you are using plate as a washer and you are using subcondral wrapped screws your plate requires to be contoured with at least one screw distally and one screw proximally. One distal and one proximal screw into a plate. So one screw which is distal nearer the uh, TMT joint would compress the plate there. One screw which is near the calcaneal cuboid joint would compress the plate. And the rest of the screws could be uh, uh, just a locking screw. And if you if you require later on, you can even change because you are worried about the he, prominent head of the non-locking screw. So you can change it later on with a locking screw. And XPIX would definitely be required for about four to six weeks. And this is the kind of a dorso uh, lateral approach which you are going to use. It starts just uh, proximal to the calcaneo uh, cuboid joint and ends. Uh, just uh, at the tarso metatarsal joints on a lateral border of the foot. Uh, and when said fixator must be maintained uh, to prevent late shortening or collapse. Now, this is a picture from AO manual, and herein they've used sun spins. I use simply JS. Herein also they've used sun spin, but I use a JS extractor, which works very well. Bridge plate, when we use on a lateral column for comminuted cuboid fracture, we are using a plate which spans from the fourth metatarsal to the cuboid, not to the calcaneus, and fix, do not fix cuboid. Non weight bearing for six to eight, 12 weeks, prevent equinus deformity. I'm going to show you some cases of cuboid fracture. Now, this was a 24 years old male presented to us with a road traffic accident. So what all injuries he has, anybody? Yes. First, so, second, third cuneiforms, cuboid, and also base of 
third and fourth metatarsals? I'm not sure whether there is there are injuries to the base of second, third, tar so third. tarsal, but definitely there is a, a crush fracture of cuboid. This where his ankle axis, this where the CT scans, which shows definitely crush fracture of cuboid. You can see cuboid crush fracture here. Yeah, so with this kind of crush cuboid on a metatarso uniform, metatarso cuboid joint, uh, would you go ahead and do fixation or would you leave it alone? This joint is important. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this should be fixed in an adult patient. You don't want to give lateral column shortening. Yeah, distraction and fixation. Yeah. So this was, and this patient also had, uh, yeah, that is what you people missed. I also forgot to tell you, there is a fracture of cystitanium talli, yeah. yeah. and yeah. there is also a fracture of talus. Hmm? So hmm. this patient was treated by a cuboid plate, a detector, followed by removal of the distractor. There was a T-wire here, two screws which were fixing the talus gate fracture and a sustentaculum talli was fixed with one screw. One this screw is, is enough for sustentaculum talli, right? Sorry. Absolutely. Sorry. Only one screw is enough. Okay. So, and I think I left this, I accepted this once I reconstructed these joints nicely. So, he is under treatment. It's just two and a half months. This was the x-ray 15 days prior. But the message I want to give is that cuboid fracture in an adult patient requires to be reconstructed. That same patient. Is that the plate that you were trying to explain by drawing the diagram? No, no. This what is, what is this? Plate. This is a specific cuboid plate. This is a synthesis plate. Okay. Cuboid. This fragment specifically. Okay, now this is also an interesting case. Uh, you see there is a fourth metatarsal. fracture of fourth metatarsal and there is also a comminuted fracture of cuboid, cuboid. and there is a fracture of third cuneiform, cuneiform and this patient had severe instability of this area and more than that, this were the CT pictures, very bad combination, and this was the skin condition. So, how would you proceed? External fixator. Mm -hmm. Okay, so external fixator. So, some surgeon sent me these pictures, and he wanted my opinion. I said, you put in external fixator. And if you are able to fix fourth metatarsal with a K wire, uh, that too with a joint sparing K wire without violating the collateral ligaments of the joint. Uh, and this is what was done hmm. when the you said, is not. This, yeah. So, K wire, yes. <laughs> so, we have, we have expert people. So, this K wire was out, and this is how we did the fixation, external fixator. And this was the lateral image. And with this skin condition, you would definitely wait, right? Yeah. So we waited and then this is when he was taken for the definitive fixation. So I went in and put in a plate to fix the fourth metatarsal. And then this patient had a intercuniform instability. So if I want to build it, I had to put in a screw which would go from the fifth metatarsal right into the a screw was passed right from the fifth metatarsal base to 
first cuneiform to second cuneiform up. So this was the first group to give stability into the intercuneiform area, and then a plate spanning the third and the fourth ray was passed. So this was quite unstable. Now this is not the usual scenario you would do it. That's why I bring in this case. Because How do you assess that intercuneiform instability? Sir? Yeah. So the first thing whenever you're dealing with the Lisprank injury is to clinically see or intraoperatively document that there is no intercuneiform instability. Like calcaneus, in calcaneus we are building our reduction onto medial sustentacular fragment. And the first thing we do and make sure is that fragment is in position. Like for a Lisprank injury, we are trying to build our reduction onto cuneiform. So cuneiform itself must be stable. So if it is not stable, then you have to make it stable. So whenever you're doing Lisprank surgery, then the first thing you will put in would be intercuneiform screw if it is unstable. And then you build your reduction over it. So similarly, when going ahead with the surgery, before you go in into the surgery, you manipulate and look for this instability. And when you open it, you see that the capsule ligament structures are already lost and you will be able to see that this has gone highly unstable. So this is how the first screw and then to make this whole unstable thing stable, I had to put in a plate which was bridging third and fourth ring. And obviously this has to be removed as fast as possible. And a split for the metatarsal fracture. And this is how everything healed. And this was the final picture. And then I removed the bridging plate as well as that screw, which was passing from the fifth metatarsal base to the cuneiform. And the, this is the This is the function, obviously, uh, not much of the inversion, inversion, but good dorsiflexion, plantarflexion has gone back to his routine work. So this was one case where I had fixed the third and the fourth and fifth lateral column rigidly with the third range. That's why I showed you this case. It's a situation's demand that you need to do that also. Okay, now this is a very good case. We published this case also. So a female, no, a female patient had a road traffic accident. It was a compound injury. So a general surgeon did the suturing, and there was no bony injury. So she was uh, just given a crepe bandage. This injury went on to bad infection. So general surgeon debrided the study and the wound was on a planter side. So debridement was done by a general surgeon. Then he said that now probably there is some infection. It did not come under control. There was discharge from the wound. So general surgeon thought that now there is some osteomyelitis. So he was sent to orthopedic surgeon for the debridement. Now, this were the x-rays. And do you see something here? Cuboid and calcaneum yeah. osteomyelitis. Yeah. So there is, there right. doesn't seem there is no cuboid only. Yeah, there is a there is a huge void. Kind of a void here, right? Yeah, there's so, no cuboid. So there was a penetrating injury from plantar aspect going up to dorsal aspect. And if you see the X CT scan. There is a loss of cuboid into this infected area. And you can see this defect here in cuboid. Now, this patient had a plantar Wound. sinus as well as a dorsal uh, issue. Now, this is how the MRI was also taken. And it also showed that there is... Uh, infection here. So this was treated as some kind of infection into the cuboid. So orthopedic surgeon went in and did the debridement and he opened this dorsally. The sinus was on a plantar aspect 
but because of it being onto the weight bearing area he chose not to go dorsally and he tried to go from uh, he chose to go dorsally and he did not go plantarward and it was then that this patient did not got relieved and infection came did not came under control he was sent to us and this was at my debridement which i did from the plantar aspect i could find out some loose link pieces like foreign material and this kind of uh, dirty sinuses there was a dorsal as well as plantar debridement and at at the end of my debridement i put in an expix and this was the defect now comes my question that how would you deal with this a young lady who has a defect on a lateral aspect in the whole cuboid almost half of the cuboid is lost uh, and then you have a fourth and fifth metatarsal basis this articulation is not there this articulation is exposed so the challenge was to treat this defect so first i went in and put in antibiotic antibiotic impregnated cement granules continued with the expix and this was the plantar incision for debridement this was the dorsal one and this was a picture and everything came under control there were no fever no temperature serology was normal and it was now at the end of another 6 weeks what kind of management we would be doing to really manage this defect can you do fusion of fourth and fifth tarsal metatarsal joint no sir should we be doing it no was that some mobile segment so should you be doing a calcaneo cuboid joint as fusion or suppose you are putting something here should you be fusing it with this calcaneus yes yes sir yes so if you fuse if you put in a bone graft here if you put in a bone graft here how would you prevent this bone graft fusing into this area So that was the challenge. The distraction. Yeah, Any interposition of the plastic. So what interposition? I'm not sure, sir. Okay, but your thought process is absolutely perfect. So then, at the second and final debridement, when everything healed. the plantar ulcer also healed i went in removed the cement granules lavaged everything put in took a graft from the iliac crest which i wanted to put in but i did not wanted to fuse fourth tmt joint so i took in fascia lata this is fascia lata right and so this is the graft i think this is a fibular graft and i put in a spanning plate from fourth to calcaneus and one screw was also passed through the graft but the space which was left out i filled in with this is a fascia lata and in a closer view can you see that's a fascia lata and that's a spanning plate on the fourth ray and this is how it went on to heal then the fixator was removed everything healed bone graft consolidated and the moments this all scenario took about a year and a half this is inversion inversion and this is her walking video and this case was it was a post traumatic 
osteomyelitis of cuboid which is one of the very rare condition uh, sir cc joint didn't seem to fuse sir in that case hmm? in the post operative x ray sir the, the cc joint has not been completely fused and the uh, or is it like that only now no cc joint is fused because i put in a uh, cancellous bone graft between that graft and the cc and the cuboid uh, so at at the distal end it, the graft was touching that half of the cuboid which was already there and at the proximal end we had put in some grafts and a plate and the gap between the fifth fourth part of the fourth and fifth and the cuboid was filled with the uh, facial atta graft that gap was filled with the graft so uh, this was like post traumatic osteomyelitis of cuboid which is one of the very rare thing and it was because of the piercing injury into the foot and everybody focused on to debriding the dorsal aspect not the plantar aspect so they were worried about the plantar aspect and then some foreign bodies were lying inside which were not allowing it to heal and it gave rise to loss of uh, void which was then replaced with uh, excision interposition arthroplasty was the arch easy to maintain on the lateral side sir in this case because you have put in the graft in between uh when <laughs> some compromise you will have to do because you cannot okay. maintain the arch with the uh, graft which is a straight one which yes, is sir. exactly at the summit of the lateral arch so when okay. I mean, you will have to accept certain things but the but the importance lies in the fact that the metatarso cuboid joint are left flexible and they normally have 13 to 15 mm of dorso plantar movement so if they are left flex flexible patients you know covering the ground and uh, walking would be easier she had better movements on this side sir than the other side <laughs> not not is that but she is happy and she has gone back and she is married also now so any question or any uh, confusion into what we discussed today about the midfoot injury uh, if not then we will discuss about today's case and today's question so today i put in a case where the, there was very shattered fibula and it was a delayed presentation and then many of you said i mean they were almost apt correct uh i think uh, for a very shattered fibula you should go ahead and fix the medial column most of you came up with that and you could use a, a a hook plate to you know really maintain the bones into position so that's one thing second thing you can use an anatomical plate which is very very vital at least you can get a variable anatomical plate so we can have get catch hold of one or two uh, fragments and one or two screws the third thing you can use is an orthogonal anterior plate so many times i am forced to use such a plate when you have a lot of combination so from an anterior plate you may be able to get hold of one or two uh, uh, fragments and one or two screw from an uh, anatomical plate you may be able to get an access to two three screws. so you will have a reasonable it is never hold into the distal segment and then when it is an old fracture and you want to lengthen it you will have to do a supraspinatus osteotomy and dissect it with a push pull kind of a screw and try to gain the length of uh, uh, committed uh, lateral myelitis uh, at the same time in an old case you should be Now explaining to your patient that you know if these fragments are not really manageable, we may have to excise it, and we may have to do, uh, may have to pass a peroneus uh, 
along the tendon from the fibular lower end and reconstruct the lateral collateral ligament of the ankle. Uh, then the second was the question of the day into which the most of the people you just came up and said yes that subtalar joint is bad and you we need fusion of subtalar joint but uh, we should try to salvage ankle as far as possible so if you see in that x-ray image there was a dorsiflexion malunion of the talus in this dorsiflexion malunion of talus just needs an anterior approach and you need to excise carefully that prominent uh, talar uh, portion to make it plus and you also should excise the part of prominent uh, ankle uh, anterior aspect and then patient would have a good dorsiflexion uh, without pain so that patient to me would require a correction of dorsiflexion malunion of the talus to do good ankle movement and subtalar joint fusion for subtalar arthritis uh, there is a question tips on putting screw into navicular bone as being a convex bone very difficult to align you are absolutely right so it is a convex bone in both the planes so in in a in a uh, in one plane it is going from medial posterior to lateral dorsal in another plane if you see it is going it is matching the head of the navicular Ahead of the talus, so yes, it is definitely difficult, but you should be using frequently internal oblique as well as external oblique view. That is very important. Second thing, you should be able to judge and know that which is the bigger fragment and where is it lying. Is that dorsal or lateral? Is that dorsal or medial? And then, according to that, once you know this anatomy of the fracture. Once you have these two images intraoperatively, you would be able to pass in the wire. Normally, I put in either a Herbert screw or a 3.5 mm uh, micro screw of Arthrex for such cases. You can, you can put in a Herbert screw, you can put in a, a 3 mm, uh, 3.5 mm screw. If it is comminuted, you may not compress it. So, that is uh, important uh, for you that you intraoperatively monitor your lateral AP, internal oblique and external oblique view to pass your screws precisely so that your screw should not pierce any of the joint and sh screw should go to the fragment which you want. Sometimes in a navicular fracture you need two incisions and one medial, one lateral so that with the two incisions you are able to manipulate your screw fixes and easily. Mind you, you may not have a screw which will go directly from the navicular tuberosity right up to the lateral aspect of the navicular. That sometimes may not be possible. So you may have to use uh, one screw going from medial to lateral, another screw going from lateral to medial, and so one screw holding uh, one third of the distal fragment, other screw holding one half of the distal fragment, something like that. So this combination sometimes is required. And if you're not sure about your screw fixation, you neutralize it with external fixator or a joint bridging, joint spanning plate. Any more question? So, uh, thank you all. This Sunday, I may not be able to take a session. Explanation for that, some family went. <coughs> so, we'll meet on Tuesday. And maybe next week, we'll meet on Tuesday and on Sunday. Till that, thank you and good night. Thank you, Thank sir. You, sir. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Good night.